Okay, so I got two quick slides to finish off the lecture from, when was that? I guess uh, Friday? Um, expressions and operators. Uh, so for the most part, expressions and operators in C work the same as they do in Java, right? So there's actually nothing here to tell you. Um, so the only thing you need to be aware of is that um, the remainder operator in C behaves very slightly differently than the remainder operator in Java. So the two differences are uh, the remainder operator in C only works with the integer types. So Java will let you take the remainder using doubles or floats, so using floating point types. Um, C does not let you do that. So in C, it only works with uh, integer types. Uh, and then finally, the uh, value of x remainder y um, is different if the sign of x, how is it exactly, does it work again? Java's got a weird convention for what values returned depending on the sign of the operands. Uh, in C, uh, the sign of x remainder y is always equal to the sign of x. So if you take 10 remainder 3, you get 1, right? Because 10 divided by 3 is 3 with a remainder of 1. Uh, if you take 10 and uh, compute the remainder with minus 3, you also get 1, right? So it always takes the remainder of the, t uh, sorry, the, the result always takes the sign of the first value. Right, so minus 10 remainder 3 gives you back minus 1, and minus 10 remainder minus 3 also gives you back minus 1. Right, that's uh, different than the way it works in Java. Uh, and I actually can't remember the exact rule in Java because it's very strange. So it's only a small difference. Um, the other difference is the uh, less the comparison operators, so less than and greater than. Uh, and this is especially confusing for most of you because you also learned Python. Right? So in Python, if you write x is less than y, uh, less than z, right, that means is y between x and z. Right? That's, that's what it means in Python. In Java, you can't write that. Right? If you try to write that, the Java compiler tells you that's a syntax error. In C, you can write it, but it doesn't mean what you think. Right? So in C, when you write this, what it really means is, is x less than y? Right? Now remember, C has no Boolean type, so the answer there is 0 or 1. Right? And then it means, is 0 or 1 less than z? So it really doesn't mean what you think, what you want it to mean in uh, C, right? So in other words, in Python, it behaves the same as the mathematical, um, as what a mathematician would write. In Java, you can't write it. In C, it really doesn't mean what you want it to mean, right? So you almost never write that in C, right? If you want x is less than y, um, and y is less than z, you write x less than y, and, and, right, double ampersand, y less than z, right? So you do it the way that you, uh, you write it the way you should write it in uh, Java. Uh, and that's basically it. So the, other, the operators, um, were, uh, other than those two exceptions, the operators are the same uh, in C and Java, right? So you already know how to use the operators uh, in C. All right, so the next lecture is, uh, we're working with, uh, we're returning back to arrays um, and pointers. All right, so pointers can be compared, uh, so pointers are a bit funny in um, C, right? So remember what a pointer is in C? So a pointer is something, uh, it basically stores the memory address of, uh, of an object, right? So in other words, it points to somewhere in memory. Um, but in C, you can do arithmetic with pointers, you can do comparison of pointers. So you can compare them for equality or inequality, right? So I can compare if two pointers uh, point to the same object, right? So that's what it means when you write if P, which is a pointer, equals equals P2, which is another pointer, right? Do they both point to the same object? Right? Unfortunately, that's not the only thing it means, right? Um, if both pointers uh, are null, uh, then that also, the comparison also returns true. So null in C means no object, right? So it means, to say, it means something similar to what it means in Java. Right? A null reference points to no ob a null reference in Java means there's no object. A null pointer in C means the pointer is pointing to nowhere, right? Or does not point to any uh, doesn't point to any object in C. 
Now, unfortunately, there's something called the too far pointer, uh, which I'll explain in a second. So there's a second point here. Uh, two pointers are equal if they both point one past the end of the same array. So I'll explain what that means shortly. Right? Uh, but normally you're checking our two, do, uh, uh, normally when you compare two pointers, you're asking the question, do they point to the same object, right? Or are they both null? Now, uh, remember what the type of a pointer is, right? So you, the type of a pointer is a pointer to some type, usually, right? So int star, that's a pointer to an int object, right? Double star is a pointer to a double object. So it doesn't make sense if you write p equals equals p2 if uh, p and p2 are pointers to different types, right? Because there's, uh, it really doesn't make sense that they can be pointing to the same, um, to the same object, right? Um, unfortunately, the compiler will let you get away with this, um, but a modern compiler will issue a warning. An old compiler won't. A modern compiler will. Right? So a modern compiler will issue a warning saying you're trying to compare two different, uh, you're trying to compare pointers to two different types. Right? Do you really want to do this? Right? Uh, notice that there's this little thing here that says there's nothing stopping you from comparing two void star pointers, uh, or two void pointers. So I'll explain that in a minute. All right, so here's a little example of comparing two pointers. Right? I've got my int i, right? Doesn't matter what its value is, right? So you can ignore the value in this case. So p is a pointer to an int, right? That's what int star means. So p is pointer to an int, and it's going to point to whatever uh, value i is storing, right? So it points to the object whose name is i, right? Uh, p i is also a pointer to an int, and it also points to the object i, right? So in other words, these both point to, uh, I guess, that, that variable here, right? So you can ask, are p and pi, do they point to the same object, right? So p equals equals pi, right? p not equals to pi means do they point to different objects, right? Uh, so not surprisingly, this print's true, right? If you actually run this program, so this is compare pointer, oops, sorry, like that. So that's just gonna say p points to the same object as pi, right? Which is not surprising. Okay, so what happens uh, if, you try, if you try to compare pointers that point to different objects of different types? Right, so here I've got i, which is an int, and I've got d, which is a double. Right, pi, that's a pointer to my int i. Right, and pd, that's my pointer to my double value d. Right, now if you try to compare those two pointers, the compiler issues a warning, but the program still compiles, right? Which means you can actually run the program if you do, in fact, compile the program. So if you compile that program, what did I call this again? Compare pointer warning. Right, so when you compile that, you get a warning, right? Comparison of distinct pointer types lacks a cast, right? Um, so it's trying to tell you, the compiler is trying to be informative. It's trying to tell you that you're comparing, two, uh, you're comparing two pointers and they clearly point to distinct objects, right? Um, and so that's probably an error on your part, on the programmer's part. It might not be. There, there could be, a, you can cook up a situation where you might actually want to do this. But in this case, uh, it's clearly an error. Right, when you run that program, you're obviously going to get PI and PD point to different objects. Right, so PI points to a different object than PD, which again, makes sense. All right, now C uh, guarantees that a pointer is allowed to point to the element that's one past the end of an array. Right, so if you've got some array somewhere, right, so this is my array A, right? Uh, then if you take a pointer into A, you're just pointing at one of the elements, right? So there's my pointer P, right? You can point at any element in the array. P is allowed to point to the non-existent element here, right? So that's okay. Right? So that's guaranteed to work in the C language. So the C language guarantees that you can move the pointer one past the end of the array. Right, that's called the too far pointer. 
Right? Now, if you try to dereference this pointer, right? so in other words, if you try to ask what is the value that's sitting here, right? so if you write star p, right? that is undefined behavior. It might work, it might not, right? anything can happen. Right? Uh, so, uh, do, 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 now why does C have the too far pointer? It's because a lot of old C code, so C code that was written way back when the language was first created, um, what you would do is you'd take a pointer into an array and you would just move the pointer until you got past the end of the array, right? So that's how you would process all the elements of the array, right? Use a pointer to point into the array, advance the pointer until you go past the end of the array, right? How do you know that you're done? Well, you've gone past the end of the array. So, in other, uh, so this has to be legal for all of that older code to work. And here's an example of a, a program that actually uses the uh, too far pointer. Right, so there's my array. It's a, an array of length three, right? It has three elements in it. My too far pointer, right? So the type of the array, so that's a ARR is an array of int, right? So I can take an int pointer, right? And point it somewhere into the array, right? The too far pointer, points past the one past the end of the array, right? So remember what and ARR0 means, right? ARR0, that's that element right there, right? So the address of that element is just the, uh, well, so and ARR0 is just the address of that element, right? So if I, uh, oh, what's P? Oh, in this case, so P, in this case, is just that pointer there. Right? So that's P equals ARR equals the address of ARR0. Right? Also don't remem uh, remember, you can also write P equals, I guess that's ARR. Uh, that's the same thing as writing P equals ARR. Right? So if you use the name of the array without any brackets, or so without an index uh, and without the ampersand, Right, then that's equivalent, right? So ARR is just, uh, you can treat, uh, you can, ARR you can also treat as a pointer to the first element of the array. So that's all fine. If I add a value to P, that's just moving the, value, uh, that's just moving the pointer um, that number of elements, right? So P plus three, I guess my picture is badly drawn. Okay, so my array has three elements in it, right? So P plus one is that element there. P plus two is that element there. P plus three is that element there, right? So that element there is your too far pointer. Right, now I've got P and Q. They both point at the front, the first element of the array, right? While P is not equal to the too far, too far pointer, right? You can do something on that line that's commented out and then advance both pointers. Right, so this turns out to be a fairly common thing to do in C2, right, where you uh, loop over an array using a pair of pointers, using two, one, two, or more pointers, right, depending on the problem that you're trying to solve. So P++ just means move the pointer one element to the right. Q++ means move the Q pointer one element to the right, right. P minus minus means move the pointer one element to the left, right. Similarly with Q minus minus. Right. P minus one would also move the, uh, would give you the pointer that's one element to the left as well. Right. Uh, and then finally, when you're, when you hit the end of the, um, once we move P and Q, one past the end of the array, we can compare them, right? So that comparison is legal in C, uh, and that's going to print out P and Q are equal if you actually ran the program, right? So I'm not, well, let's just run it, compare pointer two. Bye. Compare. Boop. And so, yeah, so they both pointers run off to the end of the array. They both end up here, and they're both equal. Okay. Uh, now, what about this null thing? So, a null pointer is a pointer that points to no object, right? Sim means something similar to what it means in Java. If you try to dereference that pointer, that's undefined behavior. Unfortunately, in a compiled program, it often works. Uh, it does something. Um, it may not give you, it may not do the thing you want, right? If you're lucky, uh, your program crashes, and then you know there's a problem, 
right? But it's not guaranteed to result in a problem. Uh, how do you make the null pointer? So you make the null pointer by using the constant all caps and ULL, right? So that's a little bit different than it is in uh, Java, right? In Java, it's all lowercase null. In C, it's all uppercase null. You are also allowed to use the int value zero um, as the null pointer. So for example, oh, I didn't do it here. Um, you can write int star p equals null and int star q equals zero. That means the same thing, right? Can you compare two null pointers? The answer is yes, right? So you get true uh, if p and q are both null. If p points to something else and q is null, then you get false, right? So you can compare two null pointers for equality. Uh, so this will uh, compare a null pointer. Sorry, just give me a second here. And get rid of that. And oh. Uh, oh, there it is. So there, I've actually set it to zero in my source code here. Right? If you run the program, uh, you're going to get uh, you're going to get the message uh, that's in the if part of the if statement. Right? So p and q are in fact equal. Right? In other words, in this specific case, it means P and Q are both null. Uh, but that's not the only way to test for null. So it turns out it's very common to test for null in uh, C. So a lot of the time you'll write a function, one or more of the parameters will be a pointer to something. And you want to make sure that the caller has actually given you something, uh, something that, uh, a pointer that you can actually work with. Right, so a lot of the time uh, when you're validating the inputs to a function, you're checking is a pointer null, right? So if p equals equals null, we'll check if p is null, right? If p equals equals zero, we'll check if p is null, right? If not p, we'll also check if a pointer is null, right? So those are all three equivalent ways of testing uh, for a null pointer. Right? Most programmers write if not p, probably because it's the shortest way to write it, right? Um, but all three are fine. If you want to be explicit about it, uh, p equals equals null is by far the clearest, right? That can only mean one thing, right? Is the pointer p a null pointer? Uh, so here's a little program that actually tests for null all three different ways, right? So p is the null pointer. If not p, so that's going to print that out. If p equals equals null, that'll print that out. If p equals equals zero, then that'll print that out. Uh, let's just run that quickly, and I'll explain the bar part at the bottom in a moment. Uh, so a test for null, right? And it prints out p is a null pointer, right? So not surprising. Uh, the stuff at the bottom is a bit funny, right? Now remember uh, null, um, for null you can use the int value zero, right? Um, what you shouldn't do is you should not create an int variable called null or anything else, right? Or anything else in this case, right? So don't make an int variable, right? In this case, its value is zero. Don't compare that pointer to the int variable, right? If you want to test if a pointer is null, compare the pointer p either to the literal zero or to the constant big N null or use not p, right? In other words, don't compare a pointer to an int. Right, unless the int happens to be literal zero. Unfortunately, this works, right? So the C language you may have noticed is very liberal, right? It tries to, um, it lets the programmer do lots of things that are perhaps it shouldn't let the programmer do, right? But that is the C philosophy, right? The programmer knows what they're doing. Whatever the program writes, that's what the compiler will try to provide for you. What about void? Okay, so void in uh, C, uh, the void pointer in C, so void star is a pointer that can point to anything. Right? So it can point to anything. Um, so can you compare two void, star, uh, vo two void pointers f for equality? The answer is yes. Right? Now the problem is it can point to anything. Right? So in our previous example, we had a pointer to an int and we had a pointer to a double. Right? When I compared those two pointers, the compiler warned me that there was a problem. Right? 
if I change the type of the pointers to void, right, and make the first pointer point to an int, and make the second pointer point to a double, the compiler will no longer warn you that there's a problem, right? Because now you're comparing two pointers and you've told the compiler the type of the pointer is void, right? Uh, and, uh, is void star. So in other words, the pointer can point to anything, right? So this is the exact same program as before, right? Except now instead of uh, pi being int star, and instead of pd being double star, I've made them all void star. Right? So p is a pointer that can point to anything. pi is a pointer that can point to anything. pd is a pointer that can point to anything. Right? Now I happen to set p to point to d, and I happen to set pi to point to i, and I've happened to set pd to point to d. Right? But I could make them point anywhere, or I could make them null. Right? Now, when you compare pi and pd, there's no compiler warning, right? Of course, it's never going to be true, right? Because i and d are distinct objects, so that'll never be true, right? When I compare p and pd, though, they both point to the double d, so that will be true, right? So p points to the same object as pd um, is what will be printed out by this program. So if you run that, compare, Right, so p points to the same object as pd. If you compile the program, uh, there's no warning. Right, no warning. Uh, so again, the compiler assumes the programmer knows what they're doing, right, uh, and does not warn them that there's a potential bug in their program because they're comparing two objects that can't possibly be equal. Uh, we're going to use the void. Uh, we're going to use void pointers um, a little bit later on, probably next week, or the week after. Um, we're going to implement a collection that can hold um, any element type, right? So, in other words, we're going to. I'm going to show you how to implement a generic collection in C. Uh, comparing pointers. So you can compare two pointers using less than, greater than, uh, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Now, what does that mean if you compare two pointers using less than or greater than, right? So what it means is you're trying to, uh, so the purpose of this um, is to uh, compare two pointers to see if they are, uh, to compare their relative location in an array, right? So you are allowed to compare pointers using these operators. However, almost always uh, when you do this, you want the two pointers to be pointers into some array, right, into the same array. So if two pointers point to different elements of the same array, then the one pointing at the element with the larger index compares greater, right? So in this uh, array here, so I've got an element here, I've got an element here, right? P points to that element, Q points to that element, so Q points to an element that's further to the right in the array, then Q is greater than P. Right? If they both point to the same element, then Q would be equal to P. Right? Uh, if, uh, and in this example here, P is less than Q, because right? P points to an element that's in front of Q. Uh, now, don't forget the too far pointer. Right? So the too far pointer is the one that points at the end, uh, one past the end of the array. Right? So the too far pointer is greater than every other pointer uh, into that array. Right? Um, but it's equal to itself. Uh, so this is the uh, similar example to the too far example before. Right? Here I've got an array of three elements. Right? P points at P0, so it points to the one. Q is P plus one. So it points to the two. And R is P plus three. So there's P plus one, plus two, plus three. So R is the too far pointer, right? Is R greater than Q? The answer is yes, right? So that's gonna print R is greater than Q. Is Q greater than P? Uh, yes, so the answer is also true, right? Because uh, Q is actually equal to P plus one. Right? So if you ran that program, uh, you would get R is greater than Q and Q is greater than P. Right. 
So in other words, you can use two pointers to uh, iterate over the elements of an array, and then you can compare the relative location of those two pointers. All right, more array stuff. Uh, so older, older style C, uh, there was no such thing as a variable length array. Uh, so in other words, in older style C, if you made an array, uh, you had to specify what the size of the array was and the, val the size of the array, uh, sorry, if you made a local array, you had to specify what the size of the array was and the size of the array had to be a compile time constant, right? So in other words, it had to be some literal number. So you could make an array of size five, right? But you could not make an array of size n, where n was some variable, right? C99 finally changed that. Uh, so C99 formally introduced variable length arrays, right? Although older versions of C had various extensions where you could do this anyway. All right, now variable length does not mean uh, what you hope it means, right? So variable length does not mean that the size of the array can change during its lifetime, right? Uh, so just like Java, once you make an array, the size of the array is fixed, right? You cannot change the size of the array. Variable length simply means that you can specify the starting size of the array using a variable. Right, so the uh, length of the array is defined by a variable instead of a constant. Right, so here's a little example. Here's a method called print, sorry, a function called print. Its second parameter is a variable length array, right? So it's an array of size n, right? So notice that's not a constant, right? Instead, that's a variable uh, whose uh, value is given by the uh, parameter n, right? When you write, if you write this function, n has to come before, uh, the, the size t n has to come before int array n, right? Because um, uh, n needs to be in scope before you can use it, right? Uh, so if you, uh, there's, a, there's a lecture where I talk about the scope of a variable, right? This is one of the examples from that lecture. Uh, if n is zero, we're gonna, um, then that looks like it's the empty array, right? So if n is zero, that looks like the empty array, so we're gonna print two, two square brackets with nothing in between, right? Otherwise, uh, I want to print out the contents of the array. Right? And I want to uh, print it out like I'd print a uh, Java style list. Right? So I want a square bracket, I want the first element, comma, space, second element, comma, space, and so on and so forth, closing square bracket. Right? So opening square bracket, percent D. Now remember what printf, how printf works. Right? Percent D means convert that value as though it were an int. That's fine because uh, array um, ARR is an array of int values. Right, so that's the opening bracket followed by the first element of the array, right? The loop simply prints out comma, next element of the array, right? Then comma, next element of the array, and then we uh, print out the closing square bracket. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Here's my main function that r actually calls the print uh, function. So here I'm going to ask the user to please enter an array whose size is less than 20, right? Uh, my variable n, that's gonna be the size of the array, right? Now how am I gonna read in the input from the user? So I'm gonna use this function called scanf, right? So scanf is the function that you can use to read a standard input, right? So normally that's the keyboard for any desktop computer. Right. How does scanf work? Well, it's like printf. It takes in a conversion, uh, a conversion string here. Right, so percent %lu, why did I use lu? Uh, unsigned long. Oh yeah, I know why I'm doing this. Okay, I'll explain that in a second. The second variable here, uh, that needs to be a pointer. Right, so that's going to be a pointer uh, to a variable that can hold the input that I'm trying to read. Right. So in other words, I want to read in the value of n, right? Uh, so in order to store the value from the keyboard in the variable n, I need to pass a pointer to that uh, variable, right? I can't, remember, I can't pass in the variable directly, so I can't just write uh, scanf blah n, right? Because C uses pass by value, right? So if I pass the uh, value 
of the variable n to the scanf function. Right? The scanf function can change its parameter, but it can't actually change the variable n. Right? So remember, this is the swap example from way, way back now, a couple of weeks, I think. Right? So if I actually want to change the value that's stored in n, I need to pass a pointer to that address, uh, to that variable. Right? So I have to pass in the address of n. And now the scanf function can actually change what's stored in n. Right? What's LU? LU is long unsigned. Uh, and that happens to be the type of size t. Uh, so I'll explain that in a second. All right, so uh, scanf reads the input from the user. Uh, the next if statement checks if the value is between 1 and 20. I have a valid size array. Right? It turns out in C, you are not allowed to, the standard says that the array of size 0 is undefined. Right, which is also different than Java, right? Java, the array of size zero is perfectly defined. It's the empty array. In C, the array of size zero is not defined. It may or may not work. In GCC, so the compiler that you're probably using for the course, unless you're on a Mac, right? Uh, if you're using GCC, uh, GCC supports arrays of size zero. Um, but other compilers may not, right? So that's why I'm checking to make sure that the if result is one, how, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, hang on. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. Oh, this is actually wrong. This should be if result is one and n is less than 20 and n is, oh, no, no, never mind. Oh, yeah, this is fine. Uh, I really should check if n is greater than zero. Um, but anyway, uh, result equals one. Uh, scanf returns the number of arguments that it manages to convert, right? So there's one conversion operator here or one conversion specifier here. Right? So if scanf can read the keyboard and successfully convert that input to an unsigned, long uh, an unsigned int value, uh, then scanf returns one. Right? It converted one unsigned long value. Uh, unsigned in I guess it's actually unsigned long. Unsigned long value. If you type in a string here, right? so you type in a, b, c, d, e, f, g, right? uh, then the conversion fails. And scanf will return, I think in this case, zero. Um, and so I'm checking, did scanf actually work, right? So did, it scan, did the user actually type in something that was an unsigned int value? If they did, I'm going to make that array, right? So I make a local array of n elements. I'm going to populate the array with the value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to n, uh, n minus 1. And then I'm going to print the array. So let's see what happens when you run the program. Um, it does exactly what you think it's going to do. Right, so this is, um, what is this? Uh, VLA1. All right, so enter an array of size less than 20. So let's try the blah, 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 like that. All right, so that does nothing, right? Because the if statement's not true. The condition in the if statement's not true. So it just jumps past the if statement. Right, uh, how about an array of size 10? Right, and so that makes the variable length array whose size is 10, fills it with the numbers zero through nine and then prints the array. Okay, so there's a bunch of notes on that slide. So it's not a long program, but there's a bunch of new stuff on that pro in that program. Uh, size t, uh, that's the unsigned integer type of the result of the size of operator. Right? So whenever you use size of, you actually get back a value whose type is size t. Now size t is actually just unsigned long, I think, on most computers. Right? Um, it can store, size t is the value, uh, sorry, size t is a variable type that can store the maximum size of uh, any theoretically possible object in C, right? uh, including arrays. Right, so basically the maximum value of size t is the largest sized object that you can have in C. Uh, scanf, that's the function that reads standard input. Right, doo -doo -doo. Uh, if, uh, ba -da -ba -da. So it reads uh, data from standard input, tries to convert the data into the format specified by the formatting string. So that's the formatting string. Right. Percent LU means try to, um, interp uh, try to convert whatever is on standard input to an unsigned long value. Oh, and then store the value in N. 
right? If successful, it stores the data in the arguments that follow the formatting string. So if successful, it stores the value in n. Whoops, sorry. Where'd it go? Uh, here. Uh, it returns the number of successfully converted arguments or this thing called EOF. EOF is normally minus one. Um, if input failure occurs before receiving the first, before the first receiving argument was assigned. Uh, so in other words, uh, if you type in uh, some string, when you're asked to type in an int, uh, I'm pretty sure scanf in this case, I guess I said it returns zero, but I think it actually returns minus one um, because it can't convert the string to an int. Doo -doo -doo. All right, uh, regular arrays. So the arrays that I've been talking about, right? So you make an array, you say square bracket, and then you say it's size, so size three, right? Um, or any of the other examples here. That example right there, right, where I make an array using um, an initialization list. Right? So that array there, uh, this array here, right? Uh, those are all examples. Uh, so the first one is a regular array. The second one is a variable length array, right? Um, in C, those arrays have what's called automatic storage. Automatic storage means their lifetime is the block, is the lifetime of the block that they are defined in. Right, so let's go back to this one. Right? So here, uh, this array is defined inside of the main function. Right? So that array exists in memory uh, for as long as the main function exists in memory. Right? Here, it's the same thing, right? So array n, uh, oh, actually, this one's a little bit different. This is good. So array n is defined inside the if statement, right? So in other words, it's, oops, sorry. It's defined inside that block there. So the lifetime of this array is the lifetime of this if statement, right? In other words, after the if statement, the array ARR no longer exists, right? Um, in theory, it no longer exists. In practice, it might, but in theory, it no longer exists, right? So as far as the language standard is concerned, uh, ARR at this point here may have been eliminated from memory. Right, now what does that mean, right? So that means if you write a function that's supposed to return an array, uh, you cannot return, you cannot safely return a regular array or a variable length array from the function, right? Why? Because when you make the, uh, when you declare the variable length array or the regular array in the function, its lifetime is the lifetime of the function, right? As soon as the function returns, that array no longer exists, right? So whatever you do, don't write the following code, right? So print is the same as before. I now have a function called make array. Uh, now, one of the funny things in C is that you cannot actually return an array uh, from a function. Right? So the best that you can do is you can return a pointer from a function, but there's no way to actually return an array from a function. So if you tried to write int square bracket square bracket here, the compiler won't accept it. Right? So instead what you have to do is you have to return a pointer. So make array is going to return a pointer to an int. Right? Presumably that pointer is the first element of the array. The function is supposed to make an array of size n. Right? So how do you make an array of size n? Well, I told you, you can make a variable length array like that. Right? Notice the comment, uh oh, automatic storage. Right? I make the array, I populate the array with some values, right? and then I return the array. Right? And, uh, in other words, I return the pointer to the first element of that array. Um, and now you're dead. Because when you return from this function, that array no longer exists, right? So in the main, uh, main function, if I try to replace the code that I had before and call a function instead, right? so I call the make array function to make the array and return it back to here, right? What happens, right? Now the problem is it's undefined behavior what happens. So anything can happen. So this is array lifetime. Okay, so make an array of size less than 20. So let's do 10, press enter, and you get something called a segmentation fault, uh, which is good. That's what you want to see, right? You want to see in big screaming letters that there's an error here, 
right? So this is what you want to see. What you don't want to see is nothing or something get printed out, which could happen, um, and, uh, which you don't want to see, right? So you get the segmentation fault here, and that's because when you try to print the array here, right? What do you pass to the um, array? Uh, what do you pass to the uh, print function? You pass in the pointer that you got from make array, right? That pointer is no longer valid as soon as make array finishes, right? Because that array doesn't actually exist anymore. So you're passing a pointer to the print function, right? The, that array doesn't actually point to anything meaningful. So it turns out in this case uh, that when you try to print the array, uh, that's when the program crashes. Right? So it's trying to dereference a pointer that's no longer valid. Um, and in this case, that leads to a crash, uh, which is good. Um, but you can, in fact, cause the program not to crash. Right? So if I ask it to make an array of size zero, um, it actually works. It actually prints out the empty array, um, which is doubly strange because the C standard says there are no zero length arrays. right? And it also says that if you pass this invalid pointer to that function, it shouldn't work. Um, but everything seems to work okay, right? Uh, the zero length array is supported by GCC, which is the compiler that I'm using, right? Uh, the print function, if the size is zero, never actually, uh, yes. So if the size is zero, it never actually dereferences the array, right? So in other words, you never end up down here where you are trying to access elements of the array. Uh, so that's why it successfully works. Uh, but there's no guarantee that it actually works. Okay. What time do I have here? All right, so whatever you do, right, do not make a local array and then try to return that local array back to the caller. Right? Uh, I actually felt really bad about this because there was an exam question last term uh, the last exam question. In the last exam question, they had to write a function that returned an array. Um, and about 75% of the class wrote something like that. Um, and I thought that I had not told them that you couldn't do this. Uh, but then when I went and looked at the slide, I said, well, no, it's right here. Um, so I didn't feel that bad after all. Um, but whatever you do, right, do not make a local array or a local variable or a variable length array and then return it from the function. Right, you have to do something else, which I will talk about next class. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it there, um, because the next part, uh, I don't wanna talk about dynamically allocated arrays and then uh, only get partway through it.